Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 134, the podcast where we talk about photography, videography, and anything that's got anything to do with any of that. With me, Kirst Nuts, and yet another super awesome guest. Now, today, we're going to be talking about concert photography. We're going to deep dive into the art of shooting music. If you want to find out who today's guest is, well, right after this. Today's special guest is the Southern California-based music photographer, radio DJ, voice actor, podcast host of Behind a Shot, 100% geek, and one of the smoothest voices in the industry. Let's not forget Whiskey Lover. Give it up for Mr. Steve Brazel. Steve, man, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? The best intro I have ever had. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. I particularly like the 100% geek thing. That's awesome. <laughs> that is my life. I... Uh... Most of my life, I've been in IT. I've been an IT consultant or educator or something like that. So I've always been around geeky tech type stuff. And I would have started in photography earlier, but I didn't know photography was geeky until I got older. <laughs> well, see, I was super impressed um, when the last time we spoke was a few weeks ago when I came um, on your show, Behind the Shot. And we were comparing notes at the beginning. We were talking about how we approached the recording side of, of of the podcast, and it was I found it super impressive the way you you know you use technology to to record the show in the way that you do, in compared to, compared to the way I do it, which is very simplistic. You know, it's it's funny. I, I wouldn't say what you do is simplistic. It, it, it's amazing to me that you, me, or anybody today can effectively do a better show and better production than television 20 years ago. I mean, when you think about the, you know how long high def video has really been around, it wasn't that long ago we had VHS tape, for God's sake. So hey. to me, it's just, it's kind of fun to be able to throw in little simple tech pieces, right? I mean, you've got a microphone in front of you that 30 years ago you wouldn't have been able to afford because that kind of tech wasn't available to all of us. I, I love that democratization of of this type of platform. Well, absolutely. You know, I, I remember. You know, last time when we spoke, we we talked uh, we talked a bit about um, how I started with video cameras. You know, back in the sort of late eighties. Yeah, bit, mid late eighties. I used to edit video from uh, by by basically connecting my camcorder to a VCR, and I used to press play on the on the camcorder and then press record on the VCR and then just pause and you know and forward and press and so you know it, it was such a super basic way of cutting things together you know and then you could get I remember you could get a thing called a title generator which right. you'd pluck in the middle and then you could like program a little title and it would come up and again in the most basic you know a, basic form a, a basic Chiron generator yeah. and I used to do the exact same thing with video you'd basically splice it together over a video cable to a recorder and you know this is in our lifetime exactly that we that we had to do that and yeah. now i can do it on the computer that's in front of me we can video from across the world really honestly i, I and this leads into photography to video to anything like that really we're in a wonderful time to do what we do Absolutely. You know, just the thought that I'm remotely controlling my camera with my phone, which is at the same time my, you know, my my review screen, basically, that in itself is total insanity in comparison to where we were only, you know, 20, oh, actually only 10 years ago. There was no, there was no way we could connect, you know, a phone wirelessly to a camera 10 years ago. Well, that just wasn't happening. And, and okay, so piggybacking off of that, I think I mentioned to you before we started recording, but I used to do, and hopefully we'll start again, but but Don moved to Bulgaria. I, I did, a as part of my podcast, a critique series, critique show series with Don Komarechka, macro genius. If you don't know Don Komarechka, people look up Don Komarechka. But one of the things I always wanted to do when we were critiquing was be able to draw on the pictures to say, you know, this spot here and circle it, you know, what's called a telestrator. The problem was I had to do it on my iPad with a Apple Pencil and it was a green screen. So I was drawing on nothing but a green iPad. And so half the time it would be right here. Oh, what? Hold on. I missed. And I'd have to, you know, circle it two or three times until I got the right spot. 
just a couple weeks ago, they came out with a new app. I should look it up and so that I can say the name. I think it's Video Pencil or something like that. I'll turn my iPad on and look at it. But they came out with a new app that very easily lets you run a, a video into the iPad. You can see live video on the iPad. It feeds back into the computer wirelessly, and I can draw on live video. Again, we are just in this amazing space, this, this for people like you and me that are creatives, we're in this amazing meeting point of creativity and tech that I think is going to just bring out when we look back at this time frame years from now, we're going to really realize what people created is partially due to that merge. Oh, absolutely. It's and as you uh, rightfully called it earlier, it's a democratization of, you know, of, of creativity, really, because now, you know, you can let the, the simple things that you don't have to worry about anymore. Like, a, a sim I mean, a very super simple thing, like, uh, you know, keeping a subject in focus, for instance, with eye tracking. Like I found, you know, the difference, I mean, the difference between me using the, uh, the, the Nikon Z6 II, which I'm using to record myself right now, in comparison to the D750, which I used to use until fairly recently, which doesn't have eye tracking or anything. Like just the sheer ball ache, basically, to keep myself in focus with the D750, was such a pain in the neck. You know, I had to like take my camera back, place it on my chair, then, you know, focus on that and then kind of just, you know, hope that I wouldn't move forwards and backwards too much so that I stay in focus. It, it was just, uh, you know, it was it was ridiculous really. And now I do nothing, absolutely zero. I do nothing of the sort. I just sit down. I can see on my screen, it's tracking my eye absolutely perfectly. I don't have to worry about it anymore. It's like, it's a major worry, just gone. Well, and like I'm using my webcam right now as a Canon 5D Mark IV because I moved to mirrorless and repurposed to the 5D Mark IV. Doesn't have eye tracking, but I'm leaving it in autofocus mode. And strangely, I, I even though I move a little bit, some cameras, you'd see that. Yeah. It focuses quickly, but I know people who use, this is not a hit on, on Panasonic shooters, but I know a lot of people who use Panasonic cameras, GH5, G, whatever, as their webcams, they put it in manual focus mode and get a long cabled remote. And anytime they want to refocus it to hold a piece of paper up, they hit a button. And I'm like, I, I don't want to hit a button. That's crazy that I would have to hit a button. But, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, you know, so it's it's just really, it's really easy to um, to create content now. Of course, we're talking about video content, which, of course, now in social media terms is is you know the craze right now but you know but even in photography um and of course you know we've we've spoken about this uh, in in a number of episodes you know recently um you know the the way that ai or artificial intelligence is coming into photography and into post production and editing is just it's just incredible you know not not only at the taking side uh, but also when it comes to post production you know the amount of the amount of time that it saves for example, in like wedding photography editing, you know, where you might like have to edit two, three, four thousand shots or something, and it can literally do that in ten minutes for you and completely um, imitate your style of editing, which is which is crazy. You know, again, if we if we you know if we if we could time if we could take somebody from ten years ago and time travel them into the present, I think they would just go through their mind would be blown. Ooh. Yeah, and especially, I mean we were there 10 years ago, but it's kind of like looking at yourself in the mirror, right? You don't, you don't see the aging process, but when you run into a friend you haven't seen in 10 years, they see the, to bring somebody straight from 10 years ago to today would make such a, if you could really do that, would make such a wonderful movie to just see their facial expression on a lot of things. You, you mentioned AI, although it's what I'm going to bring up isn't really AI, but you mentioned AI editing your phone when you take a picture your iphone is whatever it is 15 shots or whatever that are instantly basically composited into one shot using different captures to capture different things um it, it really we're in an amazing place however when you brought up ai it, it triggered something in my mind that just happened on twitter so I was having a Twitter conversation with the same guy I mentioned a little while ago, Don Komarechka, and a guy by the name of Alex Lindsay. 
And we were talking about the fact that you've got AI system like Dolly 2 or whatever. You've got AI systems out there now that are generating images. Those AI systems are trained, right? They're not creating out of thin air. They're trained on data sets. And if you ask for the right thing, it is entirely possible that you will see very clearly the source materials that they were trained on. And so what we were debating on Twitter was the copyright issues of that, right? Even though it's creating something new and it's transformative, if it was trained on Kirsten's three heads in a row series, it's entirely possible that if you give it the right prompt, it's going to create something extremely similar to something that you created. And so we were debating the copyright uh, stuff on that. By the way, while I'm thinking about it, the app I mentioned before for the iPad is call, called Video Pencil. And it's if you're looking for telestrating on live video people, it's a great app. Also, we'll, we'll put a link in the description. Now, uh, talking about AI editing, and it really is... It, doesn't necessarily directly uh, link to that, but I want to talk to you about your your concert or your music photography because I know, and this is this is something that people say to me all the time, is you know th that most people find music photography one of the most difficult disciplines to get good at or to get good results, um, and uh, you know, I I know that because. Much like you know, much like yourself, I sort of I started my photographic career in shooting gigs because that's you know I just that's what I used to do. I was I used to be on the stage and I used to step off the stage and I used to photograph what was going on on the stage, basically my friends essentially. What um, kind of music did you shoot? So I just used to shoot um, you know bands of friends um, of my friends that that were there, um, and then um, then I I started working for uh, a charity called Buckinghamshire Music Trust. And um, so part of my job there was to basically photograph the concerts. And they were both um, rock concerts, like where, you know, they would teach kids and they would teach bands and then there'd be events and concerts or whatever. Um, but uh, there'd also be uh, lots of classical concerts. So there'd be orchestras and choirs and stuff. And, uh, you know, everything from very small venues to the Albert Hall and everything in between. So it's so really, you know, lots and lots of different situations and scenarios and stuff. Um, and, and so I, you know, for the longest time, I didn't believe that you could ever use F8 to shoot anything because from where I was shooting inside of a venue, it was, everything was black. So I was like, F8, uh, nobody can shoot on F8. What? That doesn't even, how does that work? <laughs> Until I stepped outside. <laughs> the sunny 16 rule really does not apply to us. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. And so, you know, and it was only, um, and I never thought very much of it until I joined uh, until I met my wife, actually, and I moved to this area, and then my wife said to me, um, you know, you should really, you should really, uh, you know, get to know a few people around here. And I was like, well, I don't know anybody because it's a new area. She goes, well, you know what you should do is you should, you should join a camera club and hang out with other nerds like yourself. And I thought, well, that's a really good idea. <laughs> Let's do that. And so, you know, um, and, and that's what I did. And so I met a lot of other uh, photographers. Um, and, uh, and I was initially really surprised to find that whenever... People ask me, you know, what do you shoot? And I said, well, mainly concerts, you know. And I went, oh, wow, that's so difficult. And, you know, and it seemed to be that everybody, a lot of people tried to shy away from that because they thought it was too difficult. Um, so I thought it'd be really interesting to deep dive into into that a little bit um, and to sort of demystify the process of of music photography with you know, and I may say that um, with one of one of the best music photographers I have ever seen. Yourself. Well, clearly. so first of all, thank you uh, for inflating my resume. Again, <laughs> that's the second time I, since I've known you that you've inflated my resume. One was in an email. <laughs> so I'll take that every moment. And from now on, you're coming with me everywhere I go. Right. Um, so two things. Number one, you mentioned, you know, your travels in music photography took you to Royal Albert Hall. One of the best music photographers on the planet today, in my opinion, is a friend of mine, actually, uh, Christy Goodwin. She's the house photographer at Royal Albert Hall, tour photographer for people like 
Katy Perry, Taylor Swift, um, Ed Sheeran. <clears throat> that to me is amazing photography. Her, the David Bergmans of the world. But I'll I'll take the compliment very very gratefully. Thank you so much. It's interesting to me what you said about people saying to you often that music photography is one of the hardest. I have often said, now I'm just going to come out straight and say it, and every photographer out there of whatever genre they shoot is going to go, no, 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 I shoot the hardest genre, right? If I say music photography is the most difficult genre, a wedding photographer is going to laugh and go, no. And they're right, except they're not. Music photography has so many bizarre challenges. Yes, wedding photography is low light. Concert photography is low light. Yes, shooting fight sports is low light and action. Concert photography is low light and action. But in almost all of those cases, you don't have the one thing, the two things really in my mind that make, I'm going to get hate mail for this, I just know it, that make music photography the most difficult. A, stage clutter. It is, depending on the show, and there's a lot of shows that can be easy because there's a bassist, a guitarist, a drummer, and a singer on a giant stadium stage, and they're nowhere near each other, and there's no stage clutter. But you can have a scenario where there's a lot of people on stage, and no matter what angle you get, there's a mic stand coming out of somebody's head, or a bass guitar sticking into somebody's, you know, the, the head of a bass or, or a guitar sticking into the lead singer's face, or the lead singer constantly has what I call mic nose, where they hold the mic so close to their mouth that you can't see the nose, you can't see the mouth, and at times you can barely see an eye. The challenges are immense. Again, not taking away from other genres. Wedding photography is really hard. You've got personalities to deal with. You've got low light. You have venues to deal with it, you may, et cetera. But the other thing that you have in live music photography that I think makes it one of the most difficult. Every geek out there that is a photographer, and not all photographers are geeks, but every geek out there that's a photographer starts talking about, oh, well, my camera has this much dynamic range, or, you know, they look at, at reviews on DP Review. How, how many stops of dynamic range does it have? Your eye, no matter how you work it, your eye has more dynamic range, more stops of dynamic range capable than your camera. And at a concert, you have a lighting director whose job it is to push the limits of the human eye. Your camera can't keep up with that. There's just no way your camera can keep up with that. And the logistics of how you photograph a concert, I'll give a good example and to Troy, I apologize that I'm telling this story about you, but <clears throat> a very close friend of mine, fantastic wedding photographer, Troy Miller, fine art photographer, does infrared stuff too, but his primary business is wedding photography. And I took the, the old tour that used to go around the U.S. warped tour. I used to, it was one of the few times I was able to get two passes to a show because they'd have literally 72 bands playing on five, six different stages. And so I could convince them I needed two photographers for my outlet. And I took Troy, I remember the first time I took him to Warp Tour with me, here is an accomplished wedding photographer. He knows his gear without thought. Blindfolded, he can make that Z9, or at the time probably, you know, D5 or whatever, do whatever he wants instantly without thinking. I've never seen anybody more frustrated in my life. He's in the pit and he's focusing on the lead singer and boom, the lead singer's gone. And he'd wait and the lead singer would come out and he'd go up and he's focused and boom, the lead singer's gone. And he got some really good shots because he knows what he's doing. But he was so frustrated that day. And this was daylight. Like this was two o'clock in the afternoon. And he, ha and he struggled with it. I think everybody should photograph a concert at least once. It's amazing what you'll learn about Absolutely. composition, your gear, your personal limits, all of it.
Absolutely. I mean, I always think, and this is this is sort of an approach that I use, and we've not for for no other reason other than I sort of figured out that it works for me. Um, but this is actually this is why I think this 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 conversation I'm talking to you about concept of is so interesting for me personally is because I always like to compare approaches, you know. Um, yes. Yeah. Because for all intents and purposes, when it comes to music photography, I'm self-taught basically. So I never know whether I'm doing the right thing or not. You know, it just I've just learned to do things that I figured work for me. You know, but if if somebody else has a better idea, I'm all game. <laughs> you know, absolutely. But what I do um, is I've learned through being on stage for twenty odd years that people have stage personalities. Different musicians have different personalities. Some people stand still and don't move at all. Other people jump around on the spot and take up a you know little bit of space on the stage. And some people are all over the shop and they will take up the entire width and breadth of the stage. Um, and they you just never catch them in the same spot for longer than a split second. So the same thing is true for drummers. You know, some drummers play very contained. Other drummers have all hands flailing and everything's going all over the place. So what I've learned is, is that if I, let's say I have three songs to shoot, if I'm lucky, I would use a wider lens for the first track because that gives me the opportunity to get some wide shots. And I'm also studying how people move. Because then in the second, uh, for the second track, when I go in with, I don't know, like a 70 to 200 or something that's, you know, it gives me some more detailed shots. I have then clocked what the personalities on stage are. So that it then helps me to get those detailed shots, but I can't actually zoom out and get a wider view of the whole thing, but I already know what to expect in a sense. Um, and then for the third song, typically what I'll do is I'll use that to play with, you know, I don't know, like a super wide lens or whatever it may be, you know, usually. But is that, um, what, what is your approach to that? So, okay, this is, you, you, you introduced this topic to me in the perfect way because I mentioned David Bergman earlier, who, again, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to call a friend and he's a legend. He tours with Luke Combs. Now he toured with Bon Jovi for decades. And David does a workshop called Shoot from the Pit. And basically what it is, is you go to a live music workshop. Now, I do live music workshops, but nothing like this, right? You go to an arena Luke Combs show, and David spends two to three hours doing a normal educational workshop, presentation, slideshow, as it were, talking to you about music photography and all the ins and outs and, and all the details. <clears throat> Excuse me. He then takes you, walks you around the arena, and then once the show starts, it's not a meet and greet. You're not going to meet the artist as a workshop for photography. Once the show starts, you get to shoot the entire Luke Combs stadium show, the whole show, all access pretty much. I mean, there's a show going on. You got to be aware. But I took that workshop. And when I took it, he said to me, you're, you're going to know what I'm talking about. I'm like, trust me, you're David Bergman. If I can't learn something from you, I'm flawed. And it was fascinating to me because it's exactly what you said. I talk to other photographers. We come out of the pit and look at the back of our cameras together. Rarely do we talk settings, strategy, any approach, creativity. We don't discuss that. And so to sit through the workshop part and shoot that show with David, it was interesting to me because part of it was just me finding out that do things, I don't want to say the right way, but like other people do. Like he would say things and I'd go, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not an idiot, right? Or I'm so glad that you brought that up because that's the same thing that I teach people. Part of it was things that I disagreed with in the way that I work. My workflow, the way my mind works, I'd look at it and go, you know, I understand why you do that. It's not me. And there were a couple of things that were like, I never thought about that. I didn't trust my gear to do that. And actually the workshop worked out good because David tends to lock his cameras at 6,400 ISO. And I always, you know, I'm the guy who was all my career said, ignore the noise. Noise is way over talked about it. People, if, if, if the first thing somebody sees in your image and comments on it is the noise, 
your image is flawed in other ways, right? The most iconic shots of our lives are full of noise. Nobody mentions it, right? And I paid for this. I didn't care about it. I wasn't on a paid gig. I'm like, I'm going to lock my cameras at 6,400 and see what happens. And I got usable, what I would argue if I had a client in the case, sellable shots doing that. It was a great learning experience. Take that to your first question, which was, how do I work those three songs? So I should explain to people, if you've never done live music photography, if you have all access, you're shooting for the band, that's a different story. You have stage access, you have pit access, you have arena access. If you're shooting generally as media, meaning press, or you're shooting as a house photographer for a venue, you normally are allowed the first three songs from the designated shooting area, which was is normally what they call a photo pit. If, if you're in the front row, you generally can't put your hand on the stage. You're in the front row and there's a small barricade and then there's a two, three, four foot area where security guards keep crowd surfers off the stage. That gap is the photo pit. There are times you have to shoot from what they call front of house, which is where the soundboard is. It could be halfway back in an arena. But let's talk photo pit. If you're in, because if you're back at the front of house, you're going to be using very long glass. If you're in a photo pit, you normally get what they call three songs from the pit, no flash. Not allowed to use flash. Some artists are different. Some are one song. Uh, some are three songs. Some are four songs. The common is three songs. And here's how I work it. I use two cameras. I always have a wide angle on my left hip. It used to be the 16 to 35. Now it's a 15 to 35. The reason for that is if a singer jumps in my face, a guitarist kicks his foot in my towards my face or sticks his, his guitar or bass head at me and looks right down the camera, I drop the one camera, pick up the wide angle, and I'm ready to go. <clears throat> On the other side, I always have and start with a, a 24 to 70. The reason the 24 to 70, and when I shot with only one body, I always started song one with a 24 to 70. Because 24 was wide enough for me to get what you talked about. Yeah. Get a feel for the environment. Are they a mover? Are they a jumper? Are they going to run? And I've already done my research on them, but it kind of lets me know for that show. But 70, I can get tight enough that with a little crop, I can make it look really telephoto. So I start with a 24 to 70 if I only have one body. And that's how I start when I have two bodies. The wide angle never leaves. Right hand camera, which is a Canon R5, 24 to 70. Second song, I'll switch to the 70 to 200. So that I can get tight shots of just the, the microphone in the singer's face or the drummer who's way back on the stage or whatever. Song three is whichever worked the best. So if I only have one body, it's the 24 to 70, 70 to 200. And then I go, you know what? 70 to 200 was too tight or 70 full reach on a 24 to 70 wasn't enough. I'm going to stay with it, this one. I will always, however, with one body do what you suggested. And that is I will always for a little bit, throw a super wide on stand in the center back. And I always try to get a shot of all the band members visible. Not always easy. There's one guy behind another. But I always try and get it to where you can see the face of every band member. It's, I'm really glad you've described it like that because it actually, to me, it feels like it's very confirmatory. <laughs> you know, I'm sort of, I feel like, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I'm actually not, I'm kind of doing the right thing because I use a 2470 for the first track always. That's like, because it's, <laughs> it's sort of the perfect, to me, it's, it's like the perfect lens. It's, like you said, you know, 24, it's wide enough to get some really wide shots. Um, it also gives you the um, the field of view so that you can you can kind of work out how people move. It's not too distorted, right? I, I for years I used Canon has a twenty four to one hundred five, but it's f four. Yes, yeah. And I used that when I was on a uh, I used that back in the day when I was on an original Canon seven D. And some of the shows that I shoot were just too dark. Yeah. And I'd have to crank the ISO on a Canon 7D and it bothered me. Yeah. So now I could go to 6400 ISO, 10,000. I, I do shows at 10,000 ISO all the time and I don't think about it. I probably could do an F4 lens and that 24 to 105 is such a great range. Yeah, it is a great range. And I, I've actually just recently sold um, a Nikon 24 to, I think it's 24 to 120. Um, 
which was a, a also f4 which is a great lens like a walk i call it a walkabout lens so if you're on holiday it's pretty cool yep. um but nowadays i'm just too lazy you know for stuff like that so nowadays i like it all you know x100 view x100 f is with one i have the little fuji with a fixed lens so i don't have to think about even even anything as, as complicated as zooming you know but um so I've, I've sold that lens um it's yeah it's, ne it's never worked for me in a low light environment actually that lens um you know the d750 which i shot for the longest time um, for concerts i've always thought i was a really great body because the, the low light performance on that body was on that sensor is really nice um it's you know and it's a real workhorse um workhorse camera i think i've I've had a look recently. I think I must have, I must, I must have run that through like one hundred and forty thousand shutter. A great autofocus too for yeah. for the time frame that the seven hundred and fifty came out. Great autofocus for that time frame in low light. Um, yeah, great low light performance. And and it's interesting. I love this conversation. Right, I never get to talk about music photography this way. The interesting thing about music photography is, so many of us photographers, I, I don't. I, I'm curious if you have this problem. We're addicted to gear, right? We like gear. We like new toys because we are geeks. And it's literally just, I want a new toy. But in music photography, don't upgrade your gear until you've reached a limit of the gear that you're using. And that's when I upgraded to a 5 Series. I went from the Canon 7D to originally a 5D Mark III and then a 5D Mark IV with two bodies. And the reason was... The low light performance was not cutting it as I started finding my footing on what shows I tended to shoot. Then later, when I moved to mirrorless, the mirrorless bodies that I chose partially for me as a Canon shooter were because I needed, I was struggling in some areas with either autofocus and low light or whatever. And so the gear upgrade was designed specifically to fix a problem that I was having. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I love that D750 body. Um, it it sits really nice in my hand. It's just it feels like a glove, you know, like a well worn in glove. Um, I can I can handle that camera for hours without feeling any pain or you know or anything. There's no 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 pressure points on my palm or anything like that. It's just it you know it's a slightly smaller body than let's say the the 800 series, the 810 or the eight you know D850. Um, and and that makes it really useful to me, um, or it, it did make it really useful to me. And from purely from a concert, uh, you know, photography point of view, I could have quite easily carried on shooting with that body, absolutely no problem, because you know I I did get the results. The reason why I um, why I upgraded eventually, as far as the body is concerned, was actually just that because it's not a mirrorless body and there's a lot of mechanical stuff going on inside. Um, it's just gotten to the point where things are starting to wear out or it's getting to the point, you know, where it's getting risky. Let's, let's put it this way. Um, so that's one thing. Now, the lenses are actually another issue. Um, I love the, the 2470 and the 70 to 200 and it's been particular the Nikon, uh, 14 to, to 24. It's just a, it's a beautiful, beautiful I'm lens. I'm so jealous too, because I love my Canon has the RF for the mirrorless. The RF 15 to 35, and it may be the best lens they've made. Tack sharp, gorgeous, but you have 14, and I see the difference when I see people shoot that lens at 14 to my 15. It's 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 one millimeter. Yeah, you know the Nikon, the in particular that Nikon 24 to uh, 14 to 24 2.8. Um, it's sharp. It's just it's it really is a beautiful lens. Um, but. The one thing I find now that I've sort of moved on into the world of mirrorless uh, fairly recently, especially with, you know, with the Z6 II, for instance, which I'm using for a lot of video as well. So these lenses, as beautiful as they are for stills, don't really perform. They're not really up to scratch when it comes to video, mainly because when they autofocus, they're loud and they're noisy. You know, they're not like, you know, they're not like the modern Z lenses or the contemporary um, you know, mirrorless um, Canon equivalents. Um, and that's that's really where you get to the point where you go, okay, 
so here we get to the point where actually upgrading makes sense because it's not doing what I needed to do. And, uh, you know, that's the point to upgrade. I've, I, so many times I've had people say to me, especially when the D850 came out, I remember, like, oh, are you, up, are you, are you can upgrade to the D850. It's such a, it's so much better as a, as a body. I'm like, why? It doesn't do anything I, I need. <laughs> you know, I mean, why would I do that? I, I have people all the time. But I, well, okay, mirrorless is a little different because you get some better advantages out of it. I, I There was a, a legendary photographer here in Southern California, Jack Lou, was one of the original photographers for Guns N' Roses. And he was shooting a 5D Mark IV until, I don't know, a couple months ago. And he looked at me the last show that I was at with him and went, oh my God, this changed my life. Because it can. But I know people today that are still shooting a 5D Mark III that are still shooting a D750. And they're getting usable, sellable, commercial imagery. And the analogy I always take is if you had given, if you had gone to a pawn store, pawn shop, and bought a $35 beat up acoustic guitar and put it in the hands of Eddie Van Halen, he would have taken that cheap piece of gear and made you faint. Photography, you know, we we as photographers always, when people say, oh, that's a nice picture, you must have a nice camera. There are photographers I know that take offense to that. It's like the camera didn't take the picture. I took the picture. So then stop worrying about it, right? Go take your picture, whatever gear you've got, push it to the limit. And if you can't afford it, don't worry about it. Make magic with the gear that you have. If you can afford more gear, it'll open some doors for you. But other than that, it's a creative art. Go create I, I love the fact that we somehow always seem to be getting back to guitars on this podcast. It's oh, yeah. probably probably no surprise. But there's you know there's a similar story um, when Billy Gibbons, well Josh Om, um, invited Billy Gibbons to play on one of his tracks, and um, and so Billy turned up at the studio. So the story goes, uh, turned up at the studio, and uh, Josh Om had this this room of this gear room full of guitars, and he said, "Well, you know, Billy, you just pick anything, any guitar, any amp you want, you know." It's all there for the taking. And so he went into the the storeroom, into the gear room with with Billy Gibbons. And, you know, Billy started to take out different guitars and pluck them into different amplifiers. And the thing that really floored Josh on was that no matter what guitar Billy Gibbons picked, or no matter what amplifier he plucked into, he always sounded like Billy Gibbons. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's, you know, that's the thing. It's, it's often said, like in guitar playing, you know, you, your sound is in your fingers, not. You know, it doesn't really necessarily really matter what guitar you're playing. And that's also true um, with photography. But I have to say one thing. I've um, only last weekend I shot um, I shot my first boxing event with Ooh. the Z6 II. And I have to say the difference in performance of that body compared to the D750 even uh, was really, really remarkable. And that ha particularly had to do with the iFocus. Um, motored it. It's so fast and it's so good that when when I came home and I uploaded all the all the images into Lightroom and I went through them, I mean there weren't many that weren't sharp. It was just you know remarkable to see how many keepers I all of a sudden had in comparison. You know, just remembering with the DCM50 because there was no eye eye focus. You know, it's. Uh, Sports photography is such a different thing. Um, different rules apply, and I had to change my approach completely. And I thought I knew how to do this. Just low light, fast movement, just like on a stage. Surely must be the same thing. Yeah, it really isn't. <laughs> and no, nowhere near. It's, it's, so was this traditional boxing? Yeah, so basically this particular event, yes, it was a traditional like stand-up boxing ring. Um, okay, so I've been involved in martial arts for years and years, and so... A lot of people that I train with are also pro fighters. In fact, one of the guys who owns the dojos, his dad founded the dojo I train at, was in K1 kickboxing and is only the second American ever to make it to the round of 16 in K1. So I have been lucky enough for them to say they want to bring a photographer on their team. And so I've been able to photograph a number of things. And I love photographing fight sports. I've never photographed straight boxing that I can think of. It's always, you know, Muay Thai or kickboxing or, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or MMA or something like that. But the first time I photographed it, 
I thought the same thing you did. This is low light action photography. Boom, this is right up my alley. Until in those days on a 5D Mark III or a 5D Mark IV, the ring rope would pull focus. Or the angle that I was at, the so the way they light a ring, the lights are up high, but you're down low. And so a lot of times you're shooting right into the lights and you can't get focused because of either contrast issues or they're blown out or the light's in a horrible spot and it doesn't look good, et cetera. I became uh, just fascinated by photographing fight sports. It's a blast to photograph. It Something else people don't think about when you're photographing fight sports. It can be very difficult to get two faces because generally... If they're both, for example, right-handed and their left foot is forward, if I'm getting your face, then most likely I'm getting the back of the head of the other person. So the challenge of trying to get both faces or composition right or the referee not in the way or whatever, absolutely love photographing fight sports. But same thing. I came back and my, my hit ratio was not super high because people don't realize how fast... I mean, I used to shoot them to f2.8, maybe ISO 3200, and that would get me maybe 400th of a second. And it can be, depending on the fighter, 400th of a second may not be enough to freeze a punch. No, you're, not going to freeze, you're not going to freeze the glove on, on 400th. Yeah, I mean, it can be very time, right? difficult. So. 600th of a second, you know, maybe. But I've never shot fight sports since I bought my mirrorless. Yeah. And I can only imagine what eye focus would do. And I'd tell It'd you, be a joy. Yeah, it's um, I, it's really interesting. And so what what I've what I've come to realize there is that in in fight sports, especially in boxing, so I, I do two things: I shoot boxing um, events and cage fighting events. They're very okay. different kettle of fish because <laughs> excuse me, uh, because in cage fighting. Uh, uh, they're just meant to to be dimly lit. I mean, at least in a in a boxing ring, normally, eight times out of ten, the lighting in the ring is halfway decent. I mean, a cage fight, not so much. And plus, you've got the cage to contend with because either right. you've got the you know, the mesh of the of the cage in front of you, um, or I usually have access to two ladders on the cage side so I can climb up to the t- and shoot into the ring from the top. But in a, in a boxing scenario, what I've what I've come to realize is that, of course, with you know with a with a modern mirrorless camera like like the Nikon C6, I can actually uh, use auto ISO and I can set the limit to something like eight thousand, ten thousand. Doesn't really matter it's because because the the noise ratio at ten thousand is still very 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 usable, you know. Yep. Um, and I can then essentially just focus on the shutter space. If I have a 2.8 lens, for example, I, I keep that 2.8. Um, but then I can really hammer the shutter speed to 500 plus, you know, and that's where, that's where I can get really like halfway decent, halfway sharp. And that's even, that's not fast enough sometimes, because especially if you have, you know, you have like fighters sometimes especially with amateur fighters they go into the first round and they go all at it all the energy is there everything all the moves are super fast and of course halfway through the first round they're super tired and if you shoot the third round yeah they're barely moving which is hilarious <laughs> it's interesting what you said about auto iso so i don't shoot auto anything i'm fully manual shooting shows and fights when i when i shot fights and part of the reason is that i'm on canon because shooting auto anything requires metering in camera. And I don't use a center focus point. I'm one of those guys oh. that I've got a 16-9 frame in front of me or for <laughs> still photography, a you know 3-2 ratio in front of me. And so I will move the focus point up and to the right to put it on a lead singer's face and compose in camera that that singer is on a rule of third or whatever it is, or guitarist, whatever that I want to do. And the problem is with Nikon, the D750, the D850, the the Z6, the Z7, etc., Z9. Metering, if you go to spot metering, so in, in music photography, we'll normally tell people spot metering is your, your gift. And the reason is 
if I try and use, you know, center weighted average or matrix type metering, if you're a singer under a super bright spotlight and the rest of the stage is pitch black, the camera will think the scene is underexposed. If it's spot metering and I can get the spot meter on your brightly lit face, I'm good to go. Here's the problem. With Nikon, all of those upper end bodies, the spot meter follows the focus point. Yes, it does. So if yeah. you move the focus point off center, it spot meters wherever that point is. Canon doesn't do that. Right. Only the one series, like a 1DX. Because it's a three series, it's not a one series. Spot metering does not follow the focus point. So if you're using <clears throat> auto, you know, partially auto, I'll call it, auto ISO, but manual aperture and shutter, the problem that you have is it may be, I, I might have you on a rule of third, brightly lit with a guitar and throwing your hair in the air. It's metering from the center point, which could be pitch black on the stage. Just my ISO based on pitch black on the stage, right? Or I do matrix metering and I just know that 90% of the time, if I do exposure compensation or whatever, about a stop to a stop and a half down, I should be okay, I hope. And when I asked Canon on one of the shows that I did on my podcast about the R3 doesn't even have this. Like it's it's a it's a six thousand dollar body. And the response basically that I got was really on a mirrorless, it's kind of a moot point. But it's which they're right if I'm in manual mode. It's not a moot point if you use anything that's automatic and I need that camera to read the scene. So unfortunately, I have difficulty using auto anything, so I'm a hundred percent manual in my yeah. See, you know, one of the issues with that actually is, um, so in a typical scenario, when I shoot a, a boxing event, for example, what happens is, um, so I shoot raw to my main card and JPEG to the second card because that second SD card, um, after each fight, so I, I typically I shoot the typically between, I would say between 25 and 30 something fights a night. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, the, the whole card, the whole card for that night. No, so basically, so after every, after every fight, um, the card goes into a, a laptop, which then transmits the images from that fight to some guys who print out photo frames. Okay. Whilst I pop a second card into, into my camera and then shoot the next fight. And so I rotate these cards in and out. So these JPEGs have to be good enough so that they can be printed right out of camera without any post-production or whatever. Right. Um, because part of the event is because they're selling frames, so this, so this is the whole other part to it. Um, the, the raw files that I shoot to my primary card, these are the ones that I'll edit the next day after the event, and that's the kind of stuff that goes online and all the rest of it. But the sales that they're doing you know, on the night at the event, they come straight from the JPEGs. They have to be JPEGs so that they can wisely transfer relatively quickly to the printer, which might be in the foyer or in a different room or whatever. Right. So there's this like this constant like turnaround. Um, so <clears throat> the metering has to be relatively accurate right there then because they don't have time. You know, let's say on a three round fight, I'd shoot about a hundred shots. Between between eighty and hundred shots, I think is is what I deliver basically on on that. Um, they need to they need to transfer wirelessly to the printer. Then they need to go through them and they need to pick six shots or something for a photo frame. Um, and there's no time, you know, to start editing in Lightroom and this and then the other. So they they need to be halfway bang on. <laughs> so. Um, so the metering there is actually quite important. It's 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 important that that you know straight out of camera looks good enough. It's never perfect. 
you know so i found i mean this is why that's why i like shooting with an icon there because it does it does give me that um uh, flexibility it, i have argued this with canon you know back in the 5d mark 3 5d mark 4 days and the, it's hard to get an official statement from canon because canon generally won't comment officially on anything that is uh, an upcoming unreleased feature or simply a feature that they didn't put in there. My attitude has always been, look, this is software. You wrote the software. The software exists because you have it in the 1D series. The problem is, at least in my interpretation, they see the 1 series as top of the line. That's pro. They see the 5 series as prosumer. I don't think it's an excuse. It's frustrating. but And I've learned to shoot around it, which is fine. But it would be really nice to have a spot meter. Simple. It sounds so simple. If I move the focus point and I'm in spot metering, it should meter where the focus point is. It's it's so basic in my mind. It's interesting because you said something earlier about you love the feel of the Nikon camera. It's great in your hand. The whole reason I shoot Canon is that. I walked into, at the time it was called a Ritz camera here in the U.S., and I walked into the camera store and I looked at the guy and I said, you know, my son is in marching band and he's going to be in a high school football field and I'm going to be up in the stands and I want to take pictures of him. What do I need? And I didn't know any camera gear. And he brought out, a, a, at the time it was a Canon XTI and I don't remember what the equivalent Nikon starter kit was. And I picked it up and when you hold a Nikon grip, it's really nice on the outside, but then it, it very sharply goes straight in on the inside. And that was uncomfortable to me. Whereas the Canon grip is kind of rounded all the way around. That's the only reason I shoot Canon was that day. And then he looked at me and he goes, okay, you're going to want a bigger lens. You're going to need either this one. This is a 70 to 300 F3.5 to 5.6, or this one is a 70 to 200 2.8. And Steve being the idiot that he was, looked at the guy and went, but the camera's black. Shouldn't the lens match? That 70 to 200 is white. And the 70 to 300 is black. It, it'll look better. And by the way, 300 is more than 200. I'll take that one. And it was hands down the biggest camera mistake I've ever made in my life was getting a 70 to 300 variable aperture because as somebody who didn't know photography, I, I'm sitting in the stands photo, trying to photograph my son and I'm zoomed in you know, at 70, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm at 70 and perfect exposure. And I zoom into 300 and I'm taking shots. And I realize later, why are all the shots that I'm zoomed in underexposed? I didn't understand my exposure triangle and that just the act of zooming was changing my exposure. Oh my God. I didn't know that in a way it's the biggest mistake I ever made, but being the geek that I am, it was a challenge. It forced me to very quickly learn how to use my gear and adjust on the fly and make very quick adjustments. So I would zoom to 300 and adjust elsewhere as needed to learn. So I had to learn my reciprocals. If this goes here, this one has to go here to end up with the same exposure. It taught me more about photography, making that mistake than anything. But again, same kind of a scenario when you get into live music not having spot metering on a Nikon and I only grabbed the Canon because of that grip. All of those things have made me a better photographer because of the limitation I was up against, right? It's kind of like if you, if somebody sent you next to a ring to shoot a fight and said to you, I'm only going to give you this, uh, 15 millimeter 2.8 prime lens. That's all you've got that's a limitation. You'd find a way around it. Right. But man, I wish I had a Nikon at times. And it's, I love limitations sometimes because they force you to be creative. You know, yeah. um, I remember, um, I went a, a couple of, this was actually, it's probably a year or so before the pandemic or something. Um, I wanted to do some street photography in London and I, I, um, uh, I went to the Natural History Museum with my my daughter and she was like maybe, how old was she then? Maybe six? Something like that. And I thought, you know, and I thought about, well, what, what am I going to take? Am I going to take a 50? 
you know, a nifty 50 prime lens or and we're going to take a 35 or what am I going to take? And then I thought, no, you know what? what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a 14 to 24. I'm going to go super freaking wide. I know that's going to limit what I can do and it's going to be very different and not your typical kind of street photography kind of shot, but I'm going to have to think on my feet and I'm going to have to make it, I just going to have to make it work. And that's what I did. That's the only, the only lens I took. I didn't want to take a backpack, you know, with lots of lenses. And I got some of, some of the most amazing images, not only um, typical street scenes, but, but also, you know, inside of the tube station, super wide lens, awesome. Um, but also inside of the, the Natural History Museum, I've got some really awesome shots of like uh, super wide scenes. Because um, I don't know if you've ever been, but if you, want, if you want to shoot something that looks like it's straight out of a Harry Potter movie, that's the place. <laughs> you know, the, the, the tube, the times I've been in London, the tube always amazes me. It's one of the cleanest places that there is. And I remember one time, like I go everywhere with a Diet Coke in my hand. And I remember I had one and, and we're on the train. We get off at a tube station. And I'm looking for a trash can. And there's no trash cans in the tube station. My understanding is it's because way back when with the, the issues with IRA and stuff like that. But uh, it's, it's a wonderful place. The train stations are really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're architecturally unique. And there's so much you can play with, like in any train station with, with shutter speed and trains moving by and motion blur with people standing still. But you have really cool architecture in those stations as well. <clears throat> um, it's interesting, though, you mention limitations for street photography because I just recorded an episode of my show the guy by the name of Jefferson Graham, he was a tech journalist for USA Today. He's a photographer. He does a, a YouTube series called Photo Walks. And he's a friend. And he did a recent episode where, on his show, <clears throat> where he went to Paris. And on his photo walk around Paris, he only used a phone. And so I had him on to talk specifically about that. Because years ago when we went to Italy, I didn't want to be that kind of dad that everybody wait, I've got my DSLR and I'm going to, uh, you guys sit over there. I'm going to stop traffic and get this shot. I, at the time it was an iPhone six. I took only my iPhone six, which was not a great camera, but, and there were times that I really wished I had a quote unquote real camera, but the truth is it did all right. And then when we went to France, I took only the iPhone I had at that point in time. And when I do the UK next year, I'm only going to take my iPhone 14 Pro Max. I've got three lenses plus digital zoom if I want it, but I won't use it. I've got three lenses. I've got on device processing if I want it. I've got, uh, you know, full editing suite of apps that I can use. And it fits in my pocket and it doesn't say, hey, you're a tourist. And it's safer, more secure. It's lighter, but... I can't zoom in 200 millimeters. So it's also challenging. And I, I think, I'm, I'm curious, I have a question for you. I find that I learn more, like I'm a horrible landscape photographer, I'm a horrible street photographer, I shoot live music and that's pretty much it. My mind doesn't see other things. But when I learn from people who shoot genres different than me, when I talk to wedding photographers, when I talk to landscape photographers, infrared photographers, travel photographers, whatever it is, I learn more from them. A better way to word it even is their, what I see in them affects the way I shoot more than when I look at other music photographers. Does that happen to you? Oh, other oh, genres affect you? Absolutely, 100%. Because I, I think, you know, one of the things... Uh, that that happens typically, you know, when you're when you're thinking about shooting a different genre, and this I think is probably true for most people, is that you know you initially you start you start approaching it from a technical perspective, like take landscape, what kind of lens, what kind of focal length should I use, you know, uh, where should I focus in the frame, you know, all of that kind of stuff, you know, how do I meter it, blah 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 blah, blah all that kind of stuff. Those, Compositional those like, aspects, landscape, yeah. foreground, midground, background, exactly, <laughs> and so. I think it's fairly natural for for the majority of people to to approach it, to approach something new. First of all, from that safe 
angle of 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 the technical, right? Because the creative part is always more difficult than the technical. The technical is easy because we're always looking for this like, oh, just give me the numbers. Just give me the numbers, I'll punch them in. That should that should do it. So if I, you know, this is the thing about concert photography, for example, um, that whenever uh, people ask me about that, is I try and make them understand that it's not about the numbers. Like, you know, yes, you want to you want to shoot wide open, as wide open as you can. You got a 1.8, use 1.8, right? If you got 2.8, use 2.8. I mean, awesome, right? Great. Um, the, the thing that's important in concert photography, for me anyway, is that ability to read the stage. You know, for example, right. to, read, to read the movement and all that kind of stuff. That's not technical. That's not really technical. It's got nothing to do with your camera body or, or the lens or something. That's just something that's not necessarily obvious to the novice. Yeah. Well, and and you go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I mean, and, and the same thing. I'm just saying is is that's these sort of little secrets, trade secrets. Let's call them trade secrets. Uh, they're really true. I think for for any genre of, of photography. And if you talk to somebody um, who's like, a, I mean, talk to Nina Welsh Clink, for example, about street photography. Mind is blown. You know, I mean. I've learned so much about street photography just by talking to her or listen to to her explain how she ex- uh, approaches things. You know, um, it's it's amazing uh, things that you just you just wouldn't necessarily know unless unless you went out day after day after day after day after day for weeks, months, possibly years. You know, to shoot to put yourself into that situation or into that scenario, and you shoot street after street after street. Um, then eventually you'll you'll figure out by a process of elimination. Well, you know, this works, this doesn't work. So let's let's go with the thing that works. Then you come across something that works maybe a little better than you go with that. You know, so you just kind of chisel out your way through that. But of course, by talking to an expert, you very quickly realize that okay, so you know, as long as we, cause, you know, Nina is a really good example. I mean, she goes out with a with a Fuji X one hundred V. That's it. Fixed focal length, a 35 mil thing. There's no zooming in or out. That's it. It's, I mean, you know, it's as basic as it could possibly be. So the the beauty of her images is not down to the technical. It's down to all the other stuff that she's learned. See, I totally agree. And you introduced me to Nina. She's going to be on my show because of you. Fantastic. And when I look through her website, she's got a series called Duologues. And it's very clear when you see the way that she has a, basically their their diptychs, two two images put together as one, uh, disp- disparate images, right? They're they're technically not connected based on subject matter necessarily, but then they are based on either subject matter or or shape or color or whatever. And it's very clear that the gear has just been completely removed from the equation. This is clearly Nina's brain and what the brain sees and assembles. And it and it's brilliant. Going back to what you said about music photography, though, here's what I love about the way that you worded it, because it 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 just it radiates, don't forget we're telling a story. Right? It's not about the gear. It's about understanding the show, reading the stage. Knowing your subject is key no matter what you are shooting. you got to know what you're shooting. And when I shoot a live music shot, I want to make people feel one of two things. Either they were at the show and they see my shot and remember the show. Or they weren't at the show, they see my shot and they get a feeling for the show. Or actually there's a third one and that is I'm showing them something that they as an audience member could not have seen. An angle a location, something like that. But being able to tell the story of your subject, live music, concert, music, hear the volume because of the way the hair is moving. Music photographers complain when you you have to shoot from the soundboard, otherwise known as front of house. Depending on where it is, it's far away or it's in a, literally across the border of another country, it feels like sometimes. There are days that I can shoot with a 70 to 200 from the soundboard, and I'm at 200 the whole show. Sometimes it's 70 to 200 with a teleconverter. Most of the time now it's with my Sigma 150 to 600, and quite often I'm at 600 on that lens. That's how far away I am. And then I still have to crop at times. 
And people complain, oh, and, and don't misunderstand me. I hate the soundboard. I will avoid a soundboard shoot whenever I can. But one of the complaints that I hear from people that have to shoot from the soundboard is there's going to be 15 photographers all at the same location. We're all going to get the same shot. Why? Why do we all have to get the same shot? Because we're all in the same location. I'm sorry. If I stick three landscape photographers on the on, a, on an X in the sand on a beach, I am not going to get three of the same shot. And if I stick 10 music photographers at a soundboard, whether you think so or not, you're not all going to get the same shot. Yes, they're going to be similar. Yes, they're all going to be, you know, you're limited on angle that you get. But it doesn't mean timing is out of play, right? If I photograph the singer, I may get the exact same position of the singer on you, but I might wait until the singer isn't in front of the drum set and is in front of pure black stage, or I may zoom into a point to try and eliminate other distractions. I'm still framing and composing my shot. And by the way, there's an advantage to the soundboard. When you're in a photo pit, depending on stage height, no matter what, you're shooting up on people. And if it's a tall stage, you're shooting way up on people. And if it's a lower stage, you're just not shooting up as much. But you're shooting up on people. It's geometry. The farther away from the stage you get, the less the angle there is. And so if you're at a soundboard and you look at it that way, I can photograph shots that make it look like I was on stage because I'm effectively at eye level with them. But never forget, you're there to tell your version of the story. And if, if you and I were both at a soundboard or in a photo pit in the exact same location, I just don't believe we'd get the same shot. And it's always down to interpretation too, because it is about telling the story. Now, I remember, you know, years ago, this literally goes back probably se six, seven years, maybe. Um, one, on the, one of the very rare occasions that I put a photograph into a photo competition. Um, I remember I put, it was a picture of a drummer um, shot basically from just above into the drum kit. Uh, it was a really cool angle. Um, and I caught him with a really, with an awesome expression, um, you know, drumsticks uh, flailing. And I remember the judge looking at it going, well, it's a great angle and everything. It's just a shame you didn't freeze the drumsticks because there was motion blur. Oh, and I'm like, what? This is a wild rock show. I mean, what, you know, this I mean, to me, this symbolizes movement and speed, you know, and, and the frantic, you know, drumming style. <laughs> it's like, I wanted that movement in there. You know, specifically that same, that same judge, if you were photographing race cars and you had frozen the tires, would have said to you, the car looks like it's parked. Right. Yeah. I mean, so you mentioned local photo club earlier, and I was involved with my local photo club for years, and I started getting into our local image competitions. And the longer I did, and then I started judging image competitions and I judge image competitions ar around Southern California. But whenever I would enter a competition, there were times I would be sitting in my chair, listening to the comments from the judge, thinking in my head, and unfortunately, sometimes probably out loud, you're an idiot. You don't understand what I shoot. Now, the truth of the matter is, as years went on and I would start telling people, hey, get your images into image competition. I would literally say, you can sit in your chair and call the judge an idiot and say they don't understand what you shoot. That's fine. However, and it, we kind of touched on this earlier, inevitably that judge who is going to look at your shot and maybe say some really stupid stuff may say, it's kind of like when we were talking about David Bergman's workshop or getting confirmation that we're doing things right. That judge is going to say one thing that makes you go... I never thought somebody would see that in my image. I, I, I never even, it never crossed my mind somebody could interpret my image like that. That's worth it. And I'll tell you another thing that's really useful uh, when it comes to image competitions just generally, fr purely from a learning perspective, is normally in a competition like that, you know, you listen to a judge um, and they'll, they'll judge 20, 30, 40, 50 images. 
what what is really interesting is to to take in the comments on all sorts of images, you know, your own and other people's images. And there's a lot to learn from that. Again, whether you agree with the interpretation of the judge or not is a different thing. But they may say something like, well, the shadows are blocked up or the highlights are blown, <laughs> you know, or it wouldn't it would have been better if you'd put that subject on the third or something. And you can look at it and you can go, yeah, actually, yeah, that's that would have been better. What a good idea, you know. Or you might go, well, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. Ultimately, unless you are the photographer talking about your own image, nobody will ever know what your actual intention was when you took that image. And you know, I remember, uh, I remember a story that I think I've, I've talked about on this podcast several times before. But the very first time I ever put a photograph into a photo competition, it was actually a shot of um, Alcatraz, Alcatraz Island. But I was on a boat and I was behind. Alcatraz Island and so the shot was um, so you know water in the foreground um, the back of Alcatraz Island in the midground and then the San Francisco skyline in the in the distance and you could see the the uh, Transamerica building you know and uh, you could see the typical uh, San Francisco skyline and it was black and white and it was a very narrow crop and it actually looked really quite punchy and it looked really cool and the title of the image was The Rock. Okay. It came up. The judge looks at it and goes, Hello. I'm not really sure what I'm looking at here. There's some kind of island. It looks like there's maybe some construction going on on there or maybe a ruin. <laughs> and there's some kind of city in the background. I don't know. I'm just really not sure what I'm looking at here. And then gave it a really a relatively low mark and everyone in the room just went just turned around and looked at me and went <laughs> you know it was cold as a rock i mean you know see but but that's one of the things as a judge i tell people in image competition is that <clears throat> excuse me you may hear before you say to yourself you know a yeah, that's a good comment. I, I like that. I'll take that and I'll use it. Or B, no, I don't agree with that. The, what you're complaining about was my intent. I meant to do that. It should still make you think to yourself, <clears throat> what does it mean that you intentionally meant to do something that an average viewer didn't understand? Because your job is still to, or your goal is still to, tell a story that picture of the rock is a perfect example to me of in image competitions you name the image and you generally what they do is they read the name of the image before the image comes up the the judges get a picture in their head it comes up but the judge wasn't like in a music shot right i had one of rob zombie the lead singer in black and white uh and his hair's all over the place and i think i called it a singing zombie so I had an image I put into an image competition, black and white shot of the lead singer, uh, Rob Zombie. And I called it the singing zombie. And I thought I was being so cool, right? It's Rob Zombie. It's a singing zombie. He looks like a zombie with his makeup in this black and white shot. The problem is the judges had no idea who Rob Zombie was. They made no connection to the title. So when my image came up, they were completely confused. I think they expected to see a Halloween zombie costume singing. I confused them. They weren't there. They didn't hear the music. They didn't hear the crowd. They didn't feel the pressure of people near them. They didn't feel the volume. And so I can be a purist all day long to, well, that's the story that I wanted to tell. And it's what I wanted in my image. And I made... I made my exposure choices for this reason and I can justify it, but it doesn't do any good sometimes. I mean, there's, 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 um, credibility in that, but it doesn't always do good if your image is useless to an average viewer, unless you're there to stand with them and say, here's what I was doing, right? You don't want to have to be there explaining the shot to everybody. It's fair that each person will interpret your shot 
completely uniquely. But if the shot to be interpreted needs your description, I would argue in some ways you failed other than pleasing yourself, which has validation to it. This shot over my shoulder. I put that shot in an image competition. For those that are just listening to audio or whatever, it's basically me behind a crowd at a house of blues in Southern California. I'm on the second floor. I'm holding up a 10 millimeter lens and I'm trying to get a blown out stage, but just slightly see the band and a crowd. And it took me a while to figure out the angle that I wanted. And I finally figured it out and I'm about to do it. And somebody stuck their hand up in the middle of the scene. And as I'm taking the shot in my head, I'm going, no. And then I looked on the back of the camera and loved it. I actually went up to this person and said, thank you and showed him the shot. I printed this on metal two foot by three foot. I love it so much. Put it in an image competition. In an image competition, judges can challenge each other. One guy gave it like a, I don't know, 72 or something. And somebody else gave it like in the 90s. And they started debating where the one guy said, it's just the back of a bunch of heads. And the other guy said, this is every concert I've ever been to. That difference right there was brilliant to watch play out. And I would argue as, as creatives, we need to understand who is your audience? What are you trying to tell them? And <clears throat> that can, you can put that out of your mind as you're being your purest creative, but if you're going to put it out in the world, you got to have a, a story that you're telling to reach people. If you really want to move people with your art, you got to, you got to reach them somehow. Absolutely. I mean, it's really all about storytelling. Um, you know, it's about, it's about pulling people into the image and giving them enough to, to make them understand what's going on and what the story is, but also leaving those things hidden a little bit that allow them to use their own imagination to fill in the blanks and actually come up with their own interpretation of that story. Cause that's kind of where the beauty is. That's the only way they can put themselves in the scene is those open spots interpretation wise that they can stand in is to me, that's the brilliance of what we do is I take a ton of shots that I look at and go, damn, I love that shot. Right. I just, that that's a perfect shot. I'm never going to post that. Yeah. Right. There's no way anybody else is going to look at this and love this shot, but it means something to me because I was there and I felt it. And uh, a good example, when you mentioned, you know, that you put the one image in of the drummer and they, they scored it bad. Some images are fantastic images, but they're bad competition images. Absolutely. And some yeah. images are simply bad images, but they're fantastic client images, right? Like technically it may not be a great image of the mom and her baby, but the mom looks at it and falls in love with it and will pay you twice the amount you want for it. All of those are right. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, especially when you have a personal connection to it. Um, I mean, in portraiture, you find that a lot. You know, people look at an image and they, because they connect with, you know, whatever is in the image emotionally, then of course it immediately has a, a, a much stronger meaning than, than it would have to somebody. I find it all the time. And it is, but in fact, you know, this is really a lesson I've learned in, you know, on social media, I guess, you know, when sometimes... I take a picture of my dog, let's say, who I love and who is not around for some reason. Um, and you know, I think, oh, this is the this is the most awesomest picture of that dog that I've ever taken, and I I post it. I'm like super proud, and there's like zero reaction, you know, because people just don't care. I mean, it's just it's just a dog, you know. Um, and so you know, this this is the thing. It's like we after a while, you kind of go, okay, well, there's a difference between what I like and what I'm what I'm emotionally attached to personally and then but it does it may not necessarily mean the same thing to other people because they don't have that connection like you know m my dog may be Scooby-Doo but he's Scooby-Doo to me <laughs> you know, not... there is you know one of the other things interesting because you touched on social media one of the one of the problems that I find is I don't think I don't think people, if, if, okay, if you're an amateur, post whatever you want. Let's put that out there first, right? 
if, if you don't care about client base or anything like that or how people see you as an artist, post anything you want. But I don't think people put some of their critical thought in the places that they really should be putting critical thought. I think they put critical thought maybe in shooting the shot. I even think that they may have spent an hour editing a photo. For all I know, could be five minutes, could be an hour, doesn't matter. I think they put some critical thought into how they cropped and shaped and processed that image. But they don't put critical thought into what they show okay. to the public. And I'm a firm believer, only show the work that shows you the way you want to be seen. But I see people come back from a show and do it, you know, on Instagram, a 10 picture post and seven of them are really good. But I kind of tend to see you as the photographer of the other three. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Because why doing. are they in there? Why did you post those three? Like if I were hiring you, which photographer am I going to get? And if you had posted seven, I'd come away from this thinking you're wow. This person's fantastic. You posted 10. You yeah. chose to post 10. And I don't necessarily, I think you're good. But I don't think that you're consistent. I, I, think, I think people need to put that attention into the entire workflow, including what you post. You know, that's an interesting aspect. I had, I had a conversation early on today in a meeting that I had. And... It went a little bit like this. This is about an event that's that's going to happen at the at the Albert Hall. And um, and I said, well, we we can get a number, or I can get a number of photographers in that know what they're doing to photograph this particular show. And <laughs> and what I got was, oh well. We can just, you can just train up some other staff members and, you know, they can take some pictures with a little bit of training because, I mean, they don't have to shoot, you know, hundreds of images. We just, we just, because we only use like six of them across, across our social media. And I'm saying, well, that's a little bit like saying, I mean, you know, why does it take 3000 images? to get, you know, a, a small, uh, like a handful of killer shots is because that's what it takes. That, that is just what it takes, you know. The other, you only see those five, but you don't see the other 2,995 ones. Hopefully. Hopefully, exactly. Hopefully you, know? you don't. The analogy I always say to people is, I want you to go to your DVR, and I just want you to put the news on, specifically the news, with a news anchor behind a desk, delivering the news and I want you to hit pause. Now, I want you to try to hit pause at a moment that they look flattering. I want you to do what still photography is. I want you to take life that's moving, right? A person that is not moving, but maybe their head a little bit and they're talking. That's all. I'm not talking a singer running around on a stage or a fighter throwing a punch or tackling, you know, and taking somebody down, or soccer or football or, or any of that. I'm making it easy on you, right? A news channel with an anchor seated behind a desk, doing nothing but moving their hands and talking, and try pausing it at a moment when it would be flattering to them, where they would look at it and say, I look good. Freeze a moment in time like a photograph. How many times do you have to hit pause before you don't get them like, uh, right? Yeah. It's going to be more than once. And they're seated. It, it takes, if you want to be respectful to your subject, which I always want to be, there are times I've made a mistake and I've posted something thinking, oh, they're going to love this. And they liked it on Instagram and I find out later, nah, they weren't really a fan. They thought they didn't look good in it. You can't be in somebody else's mind. <clears throat> but in general, if you respect your subject and you want to only post pictures of them looking good, 
where the picture is flattering to them. Freezing that specific moment in time can take a sequence of shots to get one. Absolutely. Also, never never photograph anybody eating. That's that's never a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I suppose it depends on what they're eating, but well, yeah. Well, generally, I've never I've never managed to get a good shot of anybody eating. It's always no. a bit awkward. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason food shots are just the food. Well, exactly, exactly. Um, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show it's uh, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you about about your content photography um i will say something i will have you back on the show if you don't mind because there Anytime. is because there is so much to explore about what you do that we haven't had the time to even touch on um in in the over an hour and 20 minutes or something that that we've uh that we've that we've talked for today um because of course you're also a podcast host. Um, you you run the Behind the Shot uh, podcast. Um, give our listeners now a few an idea as to where they can find your, your stuff. So the podcast is at behindtheshot TV, not dot com. Behindtheshot TV, and you've been on kindly enough, and it was it's in fact as we're recording this, it's the current episode, and it I loved it. It was so good. And uh, I've had a bunch of different guests. A lot. Of this, it's interesting. We've had a lot of the same guests on our shows. Mine's a little bit different. I look at it as me and the guest together interviewing one of their photographs to try and understand why that photographer made the choices on that one. We take one photograph and kind of dissect it. Uh, why did they make the choices that they made? So behindtheshot.tv for that. My personal website is stevebrazel.com. It's like the country Brazil, but there's two L's. So stevebrazel.com. I'm at Steve Brazel on Twitter, at Steve Brazel on uh, Instagram. I'm also on the new social media post. Um, uh, I'm Steve Brazel on the new app called Any Question. If you want to ask questions, Any Question is a great, great place to do it. And the accounts are still live on Facebook. I abandoned Facebook years ago, but the accounts are still there. So follow them if you want to. It's uh, Steve Brazel Photography or uh, Behind the Shot TV there. Fantastic. Steve, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, I'm, I'm sure we'll see you in the not-too-distant future because, again, there's, there's so much other stuff that we haven't even scratched the surface on to talk about. Steve, thank you so much for coming on. It was absolutely my pleasure. I thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, thank you again very, very much for being on mine, too. So this is it. We've come to the end of Camera Shake Podcast, episode 134. Remember that if you want to get in touch, um, you know, hit us up on... Uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and all the other good. And even Twitter. Twitter. Steve, you're very active on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter, <laughs> Twitter. it's funny. Twitter is my favorite social media platform, although that's changed a little bit lately. But I look at Twitter as the no, no names being mentioned, Elon. Uh, but Twitter to me is the ability to text message people whose phone number I would never have. It's, that's a really good way of putting it. I've actually just recently kind of got into Twitter. And this is, uh, in, in fact, it's actually mainly due to you, really, I think, because I've always, I've sort of always, uh, I've kind of not necessarily ignored Twitter, but I've never really known how to how to approach it. And again, you know, that's, again, that's a, that, uh, it's a whole thing for another show. But um, anyway, if you if you are on Twitter, as you're listening to this, you know, hit us up on Twitter too. Absolutely no problem. Um, but, that being said, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, uh, you know, be reminded that there's a fully fledged, fully technicolored uh, version over on YouTube. And once you're there, just hit the like and subscribe button because it really does help us uh, get found. Um, likewise, if you're on Apple Podcasts or something, just give us a little star rating, write a little review. It would um, help us out a lot. Anyway, that is it. Episode 134. See you next week.